All right, let's get into our word here this morning, afternoon. Genesis chapter 12. Let's, let's actually stand, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, or your devices, or whatever you got going. All right, we'll read the word of the Lord. Title of my message today is, When It Doesn't Make Sense. Can I have two or three people go, Yep. When it doesn't make sense. When God says something and when it makes sense, you, you, there's got to be an element of faith. See, faith is the logic of the Holy Spirit. All right? So if it makes complete sense to you, then I would even question if it's the Lord. So today we're going over the story of Abram. Genesis chapter 12. It's reading the word of the Lord says this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And we're talking about the nation of? I don't, know, I don't know why that's become a political topic when it's not. I don't know why it's become a hot topic when it's not. Um, so there's a promise here, a sign, and as you will read, we've been commanded, instructed to pray for Israel, and to bless, bless Israel, not because they're doing the right thing, it's just God wants an opportunity to make his word right with them. Yes. And we're talking about thousands of years of just doing their own thing apart from God. So it's just like, we're, it was just like us praying for you that you're just having a rough time and you're not following God at all and not doing the right thing. But we're going to pray for you anyway so God can show himself real and faithful in your life. Okay. He says, and you shall be a blessing. This is what he says. I will bless those who bless you. Okay? And I will curse him who curses you. And then all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Remember Haran? Haran is who? Uh, Tehran, uh, ter uh, uh, Terra, <laughs> I'll get it, left Ur of Chaldees with his whole family was instructed to go to Canaan and ended up stopping in Iran. Then Abram took Sarai and his wife and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions they had gathered, and the people acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. They actually arrived there. They got to the promised land. Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem as far as the Terebith tree of Morah and the Canaanites were then in the land. I mean, the Canaanites were in the land and God was saying, that's your spot. You know, so there's always, there's always, when God wants to bless you, there's always something that you got to accomplish, a step of faith kind of thing. Like the walls of Jericho. Hey, that's your land, but you got to walk around and praise for seven, uh, seven times. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar and appeared to him. Father, thank you for your word. Is a light. Is a lamp. Thank you for heaven's clarity and heaven's flashlight into our soul to get what you want to give. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So God says to Abram, Leave your country. I'm going to show you, go to the land I'm gonna, and I will show you. This is basically what he said. This was God's instruction. God's instruction was leave, go, and then I'll show. Okay? You do your part and then I'll come and do my part after you do your part. I, I kind of have trouble with that. Can I be honest with you? Some of you are going to look at me like, you don't have any faith? I have a, my brain doesn't work this way. I prefer, I mix it up, I'm not messing with the Bible, I prefer show, and then I'll leave and go. <laughs> Does that, kind of like that, kind of like, I'm like, that's more my vibe. Show me, and then, well, I'll, th I'll think about going <laughs> sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's like, let me get a confirmation first, let me get another confirmation. And sometimes God will confirm, pass to us 20 times, and I'm like, well, I know it's God, but I need him to confirm me, Dave, one more time, one more time. So I'm not really feeling that first line. And the key to seeing supernatural things in your life is leaving room for, an uncomfortable, for uncomfortable God movements. 
uncomfortable God moments. And the Lord knows I do not like those uncomfortable moments. I like what they call, I like being in my comfort zone. Because it's, I have my comfy couch. If somebody's sitting on my couch, guess what I do? And they have the nerve to say, I was here first. <laughs> I'm like, let's go. And it can't be moved. It has to angle, be angled correctly towards the TV. That's my comfort zone. But miracles, I'm not going to say never, but miracles probably won't happen when you're in your comfort zone. This is how comfortable we are. We talked about healing. Hope to shed a testimony about healing. It, it's like, oh, Pastor Tony, why do people get healed in South America and Haiti or Dominican Republic? It's because they don't have a choice. You either get healed or you die. But we have so many options. We're so professional at life, we don't see miracles. If we need money, we'll get a second job. For some of you, it's your third job. We need a healing, we'll see the professional in Boston. He's really good for a second opinion. It's an opinion. We don't say we're going to act, we're going to get a second fact or a second truth. We say we're going to go to the guy. This really guy in Boston, he knows what he's doing. He created the mechanism. He's a billionaire. And we go to him because we need another opinion. If we have uh, mind problems in our mind, we look for the best, best counselor. If we need, if we're in pain, we go see a physical therapist. We've so become professional at our lives, we don't see anything miraculous happening because we like to play it safe. We brought our grandkids to the, um, uh, to the park in Barrington. Uh, it's, and we go way over there. We always go to Barrington because we usually don't bump into church people, but that's another story. <laughs> but everything is like so padded. There's everything's, I remember back in the day, remember the monkey bars? Yeah. Come on, man. I'm talking about, remember the things you used to swing and you fall off and crack your head open and you get back up? <laughs> everything's, everything's padded. And when everything's padded, you don't have fun. And I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed with our grandkids. I'm like, come on, swing harder, climb to the top. And all these millennial and Gen X parents going, careful, careful, care. And Gen Z, parents, careful, be careful, be careful. Let's, let's be safe. And I think we've become so professional at living. God's on standby game. Just saying, you let me know when you need me. Like, I've been doing this for over 30 years. If I was an electrician, I'd be a master electrician. If I was a plumber, I'd be a master plumber. If I was a contractor, I'd be a master craftsman. But I'm a pastor, so that makes me a master pastor. <laughs> I feel like I'm just starting out. I feel like, Lord, I need you. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could do this. I need you. But when we're serving God, the more we get into this in our relationship with God, the more we feel like I need to know more of him. It, it just increases my self-doubt and increases my God confidence. And somehow, if we need to be comfortable with the leave, go, and then I'll show. I know it doesn't make sense mathematically, but that's the arithmetic of heaven. It doesn't make any sense. You haven't seen something supernatural in your life because you're waiting for God to show you first, and then you'll leave and go. God, I need, I need, and be careful when you pray for a fleece. Because God, first of all, when God speaks, he doesn't have to confirm his word. He says, I hold my word above my very name. Hebrews 11 verse 18 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And this is the part that I was like, ouch. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Man. So I would look at that and go, that sounds like he's lost. Not knowing where you're going, but that's actually faith, not knowing when you're going. Faith and feeling lost is actually, sometimes they look the same. <laughs> it's like, I feel lost. You're actually walking in faith. I feel stuck. You're actually being faithful. Change your verbiage. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what scripture says. So the faith walk that is required from us is, re is required from us. Because if you notice, we're at the very beginning of the book. 
We're, we're at the very beginning of this whole brand new world, and God wants to build ec- equity on earth. He wants to start building on earth. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 that his eyes move to and fro throughout the entire earth to show himself faithful, to show himself strong on behalf of those who are, belong to him and who are loyal to him. So God actually spins the globe. He says, I am looking for men and, men and women of God, men of God and women of God who show themselves faithful because I have an oversupply of supernatural things that I need to be represented here on the earth. God doesn't sprinkle supernatural things on the earth. He uses your life. Let your will be done on earth. This earth. Because remember, we're made of dirt. We're made of dust. So he's not talking about the globe. He's talking about the heart. And so this whole passage where Abram goes out and not, it doesn't know where he's going, God says, listen, I am so serious about this promise And he makes this promise to one man, and he says, I want you to go to Canaan. Now, when we look at where modern-day Canaan would be today, that would include Israel, Palestine, Gaza, Syria, and parts of Turkey. So when we see the struggle that Israel is having now, it's because they didn't complete their business back then. Make sure that when God says to do, it's always a good idea, when God says to do something, I know it sounds kind of simple, do it. Just do it. This, this, I don't think there's ever been a time in my life, and I would even challenge you on this, has there ever been a time where you've experienced a supernatural breakthrough when you said no to God? It doesn't work. No is a full sentence, but yes is a full sentence. And yes, in the promises of God, his promises are yes and amen. They're not, I'm not sure, and maybe later, it's yes. And they are affirmative. And he says, I am looking to increase my power and poise on this earth to this day. So he's looking for men and women. So it, heaven has an oversupply of miracles and supernatural things. Okay? And God doesn't just randomly send miracles. He needs warm bodies to say yes. And when you say yes, that's when things happen on this earth. And the most, the most powerful eight words that happen in this passage is found in verse 4. It says, so Abram left as the Lord told him. Simple. Simple. These eight words, without, and without these eight words, nothing happens. Without these eight words, the promise is not released. Without these eight words, everything dies. There is no plan. This is why God says, when I instruct you to do something, just say yes. And when you say yes, you'll see blessings follow you. So Abram, Abram took the journey because God told him to take the journey. Now, let's remind you. Abram was a pagan. Abram wasn't a Christian. Abram didn't serve the Lord. There was no Jesus. There was no blood. There was no sacrifice. There was no cross. Abram wasn't part of, he wasn't a member of a church. He wasn't in a small group. He wasn't in the mentorship program and, and discipleship. He was none of that. All Abram did was listen to God. And Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 says, Abram, Abraham believed the Lord and God accounted it to him as righteousness. Just like that. There was no such thing as this term righteousness. That's a New Testament term. God was like, I think this is going to be the first time that we're going to use that word. And that word righteousness can only be found in Christ. But because you said yes and you obey and you believe, I'm accounting it to you as righteousness. So Abraham left. We want to make, we want to make, we want to make relationship with Jesus so fancy. Well, I volunteer here, and I do this, and I've done that, and I've done this. You know, when you get to heaven, all that's going to matter is you said yes. Because, hello, Scripture says some people are going to get to heaven, and Jesus is going to say, I don't even have you, I don't, I, I'm sorry, but once it comes up as unavailable. And you believe me, so some people going to heaven that you're going to be surprised that they made it. <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble with that part, but let's continue on. <laughs> this is it. All Abraham said was, okay, let's do it. 
That's as, as organic as you get with God attributing righteousness to you. As organic. And then I'm reading on, and there's a problem that I have in verse 7. Chapter 12, verse 7 says, uh, At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. They were living in the land. So Abram makes it to Canaan. All right? So remember last week, Terah never made it to Canaan. So God gives an opportunity for Abram to make it to Canaan. Abram makes it to Canaan, but later on we'll read that he ended up leaving Canaan because there was a famine. So God gives 400 years later an opportunity now for Moses to make it to Canaan. Moses doesn't make it to Canaan, but guess who makes it to Canaan? Joshua. No matter what happens, the goal is the goal. No matter what happens, your growth and spirituality in Christ is the main thing. So God brings Abram to the footstep of Canaan, and as the Canaanites were living in the land, and he goes, this is all yours. To your offspring, I will give you this land. Your seed will be as numerous as the sands of the sea. But then I read Genesis chapter 11, verse 30, and it says, Sarai was barren. She had no children. I'm like, okay, let me track this. This is how my mind works. You're saying Abram's going to have over, he's going to have seed, and uh, he's going to have a, a, a family that's as numerous as the, sun, as the sands of the sea, but his wife can't be pregnant. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense when God is about to release something supernatural in your life, and then all of a sudden, you hit with the impossible. And when you hit with the impossible, there are times where you just have to discount what you're seeing and really believe what God is saying. It doesn't make sense that my seed is going to be blessed, but my wife is not able to have kids. That my descendants are going to be as numerous as the sands of the sea. Wouldn't it help if my wife wasn't barren? Why does God, well, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but why does God set us up for supernatural invasion and then we get hit with impossible things? Almost like, that's like a reset. That's like a reminder. See, remember what he said to Abram? He's giving Abraham all these promises and all these blessings. And he says to Abram, listen, I'm just reminding you, I am your very great reward. Not what I'm about to give you, I am. So I feel like this is a reset for God in our lives that even though the blessings and promises are coming your way, God is saying, I am reminding you. Interesting, because in Genesis chapter 16, verse 3, Sarai attributes her barrenness to God. So my question is, why? I want you to track with me, all right? I, I ended up going down this bunny trail several days ago, and, and sometimes they get me into trouble. I'm like back on track. But this one I felt like, there's something here, God. Thank you. There's something here you want to speak to us. Why was Sarai barren? Let's look at this. When they arrived in Canaan, they left Canaan because of a famine. And where did they go? Egypt. And if you remember, years later, they ended up being slaves for 400 years. God called them to Canaan. They left Canaan because they were scared and go back to Egypt. And, and as, they're going back to Egypt, as they're going to Egypt, Abram says to Sarai, don't tell anyone you're my wife. He says, say you're my sister. That's never a good thing to do. Angelo, right? Tony. But that's what happens. When you move away from the promises of God, you have to cover your tracks. And you start making decisions based on fear. And you start saying things like, I, I could imagine looking out that most wives would say, uh-uh. And, and as you should. Correct. But Abram says to his wife, say you're my sister. And as a result, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 15, this is what the Bible says. Pharaoh, Sarai, was taken into Pharaoh's house. Okay? Let's look at verse 15. Sarai was taken into Pharaoh's house. Another version said, Far Far Sarai was taken into Pharaoh's palace. Sarai was taken into Pharaoh's harem. What's a harem? That's where they keep all the wives and concubines. Track with me here now. Okay. Pharaoh gets wind. 
Pharaoh's afraid of the judgment of God. And what does he say in verse 19? What, to, to Abraham, why did you say she is my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? So this is a bunny trail. I was like, oh snap, you know, something here. Let me track with this. Did Pharaoh actually take Sarai as his wife? Because remember the pagans, he, she was in the harem. The Hebrew for house was inwards. Okay, so Pharaoh put Sarah in the harem for 10 years, wives and concubines. Now, with pagans, they don't care. They don't care if we're not married. He said, we're having sex. We don't care. What, what prompted Pharaoh to now get out of this deal was the fact that he was about to take someone else's wife as his. Okay, in the Hebrew, what he was saying is, I took her to me to wife. That is, I took her with the intention of making her my wife. Do you track me with me here? Okay. According to this, he almost took her as his wife. But for 10 years, she was in the harem with the wives and the concubines. And what do you do with the wives and the concubines? Whatever, right? So Sarah was living with the wives and the concubines for 10 years. And for 10 years, Sarah did not get pregnant. Why? Because she was barren. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 16, verse 3. What does she say? God is the author of my barrenness. Why was Sarah barren? Let's go back to that question again. God was protecting her baby. He closed the door so that seed would only be produced through the promise. Oh, I'm frustrated, God. You may be frustrated at God, but God's like, I'm keeping you safe. God, you took your hand off of my life. Actually, no, I have my hand on your life. Oh, God's like, don't be angry with me. I'm protecting you. What does David say in Psalm 139? God, you know me full well. And as a result of you knowing me, you hedged me in. You hedged me in because you don't want me to make the same stupid decision that I made several years prior. God, I'm frustrated. I want to be launched. God's not going to launch you past your character. So what's happening here? God's saying, I don't trust you. I don't, but I, I love you, but I'm not, I don't trust you. And I've given you the promise, but I'm not going to entrust you with the promise until I trust you with the promise. He says, I'll be the one to produce through you. And what's that ultimate production of seed? Was Jesus. And you know, you figured after this powerful moment, Sarah says, God is the altar of my barrenness. And she goes to Abram. All right, Abram, you take Hagar. It's like, what is going on here? What is happening? So maybe God has closed you in. And you're saying, it just doesn't make sense. And you're not ready to walk this walk of faith until you're ready to walk the walk of obedience. And you're praying for God to do great things. And God says, I just need one thing great from you, obedience. And that's why I put that bracelet around your ankle. So there's a boundary. You don't get, what did he say to Joshua? When Joshua finally made it to the promised land, you know what he said to Joshua? He says, wherever you place your feet, I will bless what was the context? The context was promise. The context was, a, was covenant promise. This is the favor of God. So we learned several things here. And the first thing we learned is God is going to ask you to do something impossible. Something you can't do on your own. Something that not even a, as a master Christian that you've been serving the Lord for so many years, you're going to be able to say, yep, I can do this on my own. No, you'll never be able to do this on your own. This is the word of the Lord. Another thing that we learn from this is you're going to be tempted to compromise. Water it down. Let's do this. Generic here. Generic over there. Another thing we learn is God's protection is for your seed. Here's it there now. There's something inside of you that God has spoken that makes you valuable and dangerous. 
So don't take it personal when the enemy comes at you. Because when the enemy comes at you like a flood, the Spirit of God raises up a standard. Come on now. There's something in you. What was in Sarah and Abram? Jesus. Then when we follow the lineage, Jesus, the author finisher of our faith, was going to be produced through, through that lineage. There's something in you that is dangerous. So God is protecting you. And yes, even from you. <laughs> Because my greatest enemy is my inner me. And some of you here this morning, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're like, oh God, what is happening? God's like, I'm protecting you. The fact that you're frustrated, that's the only thing keeping you saved. The pressure that you're feeling with, that you're dealing with now, is the only thing keeping you. Because the last time God gave you that breakthrough, you backslid. It's time. Abram has the nerve to pimp the promise. How in the world are you allowing Pharaoh to hug your wife? This is God's promise. God spoke this over you, and Pharaoh's holding hands with your wife. You're prostituting covenant here. I was like, what are you doing? Say you're my sister. For 10 years! 10 years! That's, that's, I don't know, that's a long time. Is that a long time? God gave you a promise. You were there. You left it. To go to Egypt. Because it just didn't seem. There's going to be times when God calls you into a situation like Canaan, which is promise, and it doesn't make sense, but you stay put because that's where God called you. And God is going to ask you to do supernatural things that, you know what? It just said, God, if you show, then I'll leave and go. I'm not going to just pack the U-Haul truck and start driving south. Tell me where... To give me the final destination so I can pop in my GPS. And then I'll know. But if you're telling me just to start going and then you'll show me, but that's what God is asking. Right, James? David, that's exactly what God is asking. And then when we, when we live in fear, we begin coming up with our own solutions and we cheapen what God wants to do. That's why Sarah said, my barrenness is authored by God. What I'm going through right now is authored by God because He's keeping me for the day of promise. He's authoring my, my role for the day of redemption. He's authoring my process for the day of the promise. I have, I have faith. Sometimes I struggle with trust. I don't struggle with faith. I struggle with trust. Faith is, I know that I know that I know that I know God's going to come through. I just don't know what I have to walk through. The trust part, sometimes I'm like, oh no. And Abram's like, say you're my sister, real quick. Twice! He did this twice! You figure it after the first time, you go, don't, let's not say that again. <laughs> what does she do? She takes her wedding band off. He takes his wedding band off for 10 years. You're, you're in covenant with God, and you have no right to take your wedding band off. I remember I worked for a guy when we lived in Ohio. We were newly married. We were young. And I worked with this man. Every time he would get around a girl, he would take his ring off. Now, I didn't know. I'm like, why are you, why are you taking your ring off? He was like, shh. You're blowing up my spot. No, he, that, that's not what, that wasn't a word, a phrase back then, but whatever he said. It's like, we're always trying to take off our rings to match the covenant that we're in. But I'm going to tell you, you're only in covenant with God. The enemy will take you longer than you want to go, make you spend more money than you want to go. And at the end, you'll sit in a corner depressed, dark, and lonely. He says, I've given you life, though, and life more abundantly. So don't you say, let's take that back. You're my wife. And let's get back to Canaan. Let's get back to the very place that God called you to. So, you may be at this place. This is what I felt this morning. You may be in this place where you're like, man, it's been a while since I felt God's presence. I haven't felt His presence. I haven't felt His voice in a while. I haven't felt God like I used to feel God. Is it possible it's because you left the land of promise and you went somewhere where you were fed 
you were taken care of, you were protected, but you didn't grow in your character. Back to Canaan. That's what God, so you may say, God, I miss you, but God is saying, I miss you. You're saying, God, where you been? God is saying to you, where you been? He said, draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. He doesn't move, ever. You moved, ever. So let's get back on track now. Back to the basics. The basics is God called you to Canaan. That's the land of promise. Your focus is. It's not a place you arrive. It's a place you live. It's a place you experience every single day. His promises are yes and amen. I love the Message Bible. The Message Bible says it's our yes and His yes working together. So if we say no, He already said yes at the cross. No, He said yes at the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, I want to say no, but I'm going to say yes. So there's always a yes. Sometimes we say no, and what happens? But when there's a yes and a yes, that's when covenant happens, and that's when supernatural things happen in your life. So if he says yes and you say no, there's not going to be any production. You'll be barren spiritually. In your workplace, you'll be barren. That's why you got to get another job to make ends meet. You pay your bills, but you miss the breakthrough of him being Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You miss all this good stuff. Surely goodness and mercy. All the days of my life. You miss all of that because he says yes and you say no. Back to Canaan. That's why nothing's been happening. You've been having results but no fruit. Barren. The Lord is the author of my barrenness, Sarah says. Because now I see it. And she says, Abraham, I have a good idea. Why don't you sleep with Hagar? Like... At what point do we go, I learned my lesson. <laughs> uh, there's got to be a point along the narrative of the story. Sean, where we go, ding, got it. Start walking back to Canaan. So today God wants to restore, the scriptures to restore the years of canker worm has eaten and just put you on track. It doesn't have to be a long, belabored thing. It's just saying, Lord, thank you for your power of forgiveness on my life. I see now why I'm frustrated, angry, barren, and nothing good is happening in my life in terms of fruit. There's results, but no fruit. Forgive me. Clean my heart. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, man, what a day, June 2nd, to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That's it. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive me of my sins. I need you to be my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Take away my shame and my guilt. I want to live in the abundant life and live under your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you're here today, you prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to raise your hand wherever you're at. Where you at? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoa! I lost count. Hold on. What? Oh, come on, come, quick. Quick, quick, come up here. Before you before you change your mind. Come on, guys. Come, come. Family. Oh my gosh. Jaylon, your parents.